Anytime we're dealing with fixed or variable overhead, we are into forecasting and averaging to figure out what the costs are. And there's no easy answer. There's no particularly good technique, but there's a stopping point at the beginning that you have to assess what you are attempting to do. Okay? And I know what my answer is on what I attempt to do. Um, it's not the traditional answer. Uh, I think the traditional answer is wrong, and I think the people that do it are wrong. Um, we're not really that interested in accuracy at this point. What we want is acceptability by the people that will be doing the work and using the number. Because, you know, we have to think about what we mean by the word accuracy. Okay? The techniques, the numeric techniques we use have different levels of, quote, accuracy, but they depend on what you're attempting to do and what you think the data is actually telling you. So one thing that people propose to use during, you know, for things like this uh, is regression analysis. And you have a number of classes where you learn regression analysis. And professors love it, but mostly the professors that love it don't really have much real business experience because I know there's nothing wrong with regression analysis except you have almost no chance of doing a good job. Regression analysis is a completely dangerous, difficult, complex task. My advice to you, and it's not just like maybe advice. Actually, it's not even advice. My order to you. I am directing you to never, ever use regression analysis yourself until you get a master's degree in statistics. I can guarantee you, you will do it wrong. With real world data, if you don't have training up at the master's level, it's 100% that you will screw it up because regression analysis is really sensitive and really difficult to master. The way they teach it, they just teach it to you like jump, you know, stuff numbers in a program. And you know what? They're using fake data when they do that. So real world, world data just doesn't work. So if you have a time when you actually truly think you need regression, and trust me, you're not, you know, that's also bogus most of the time, don't do it yourself. Get the data ready and you hire a consultant. You hire someone that has at least a master's in statistics, at least, and who does this all the time. This is like taxes. I mean, would you just hire somebody off the street, like a, a Brock Biak grad who's taken, you know, three tax courses? and then say, do my taxes, if you had something complex? Like, if you had something really tricky, are you going to do that? Are you going to hire someone that has less than two years' experience to do something really sort of dangerous? No. Statistics is the exact same thing. And regression is really bad at giving you bad readings. Okay? So that's sort of step one. Don't ever do it. It's too dangerous. And, you know, I'm, it's, it's odd, but I probably have the best statistical training of anybody in the Goodman School. That may not be true, right, because I don't know everyone, but I don't know of a single faculty member here who has better statistical training than I do. I don't know of one. There may, you know, there could be one or two. One of the things I have is I have more classes in advanced statistics, but also all of my statistics training was from statisticians. It wasn't from business professors. And business professors, when they do stats, they cut so many corners that their results are almost always flawed and not really usable. So just trust me, don't ever do this on your own, okay? And then when something comes up where you do need it, and it might happen, you know, a couple of times in your career, or maybe in certain businesses it could happen a lot. If you go into oil and natural gas or you're dealing with a lot of coal, like where you're dealing with a lot of commodities, you know, like millions of millions of barrels of oil and things like that, okay, you, I could believe a regression analysis could help you hire somebody. Do not do it yourself. I don't care what Excel can do, okay? Now that is if you want numeric accuracy. But remember... Excel only, even if you want to claim it's more arithmetically accurate, it's only arithmetically accurate at measuring what happened in the past. You want to believe that that line will continue into the future? Well, good luck. Have fun with that. You know, you can use that and you can go buy lottery tickets. You know, regression is not a good forecasting tool unless the assumptions are carefully met. And trust me, they are never met. 
Okay? They're never met for internal data. You have to assume that the entire process is exactly the same. So if you want to have three years data, you have to say, no, it, no, no part of this process has changed. The people haven't changed, the instructions haven't changed, the software, the hardware, the, the equipment, the supply chain, the economic factors, the commodity prices, nothing has changed at all in three years. If you can say that to me, I'll say, okay, use, you know, use regression. But you know what? You're never going to be able to say that because stuff changes. As soon as you change those factors, then regression is not predictive because you can only use regression to predict the future when your data is the same or when you believe that the past is the same as the future. Right? So we don't want to do that. How can you get the kind of accuracy that you can use is you get the shared opinion of people in your company who are experts at certain relationships. So the best tool is actually to just plot the data and look at it and discuss it. Get everyone in the t around the table. And I mean everybody. And, and notice, a traditional company can't do this. Top-down, manager-led companies can't actually, you know, part of managers' ideology is they, they're not going to listen to people. You know, they, they think they're the experts. They're, you know, they're not good listeners. And, you, you know, if you work internationally, you'll see what I mean. You know, basically, you know, Americans and Canadians and Brits are not good listeners. So... What we need to do is take a look at how we can set this up to actually have shared knowledge. So the best tool is actually uh, just to plot and not use any statistics and get everyone whose neck is on the line, like all the manufacturing supervisors and the marketing people, get them in the room and look at the dots. Okay, so what you need is you need to plot what you're doing. In this case, we're thinking about overhead. So we want to look at all past overhead costs. So what we would do is get a chart, dollars, you know, time, and we would just plot the dots of the chart. And we would say, or actually I said time, probably I should say uh, production volume instead because we want to see what the overhead cost was at certain production volumes. And actually, what we really want to know is what the, co uh, the overhead cost, what we think the overhead cost will be next year with the production volume we're guessing we're going to have next year. So what we want to have here is production volumes, not time. And then we're going to have a bunch of dots here. And, you know, if you want to draw a line on the dots, you can draw a line on the dots, you know. There are different ways. You can just fit it here and you can say, okay, well, you know, I think this is the line. And the next person can say, no, I think, you know, I think this point was an outlier. Remember, this is when, uh, this is when all of a sudden production dropped and we, we uh, did, you know, the temperature changed and we didn't have to heat the building because we had a, the, the, the two or three hot weeks in November. And so actually the cost is low here at this volume, but it was because of that weather fluctuation. I remember that. So you can say, yeah, we shouldn't, you know, that's actually bad data, right? It doesn't represent what normally happens. We should get rid of that. And so the people there talking can talk about that. And they'll say, so I'm going to draw my line differently because I'm, I'm going to draw a line that doesn't include this dot because I think that's a bogus dot that we can't rely on. And they'll, you know, hold their ruler out and they'll draw some different line. And then you'll discuss it and you'll say, well, but what does the sales forecast think we're going to do? Well, you know, the sales forecast says that we're going to have sales of about right there. So the question is, what do we think overheads are going to be at that production volume next year? Now this is where if you use regression analysis, you're using last year's prices, last year's labor contract, last year's machine. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Is the regression computed line the more accurate line that's correct? But that accuracy is not helpful to you to know what next year is going to be like in the circumstance that you believe you'll have next year. You don't have data. And well, you might have some. Like you might know if the labor contract changed, you might know the labor rates went up a little bit. But a lot of the other stuff you don't know. You don't know exactly what the cost of electricity is going to be nine months from now. You don't know cost of certain oils, certain other inputs. You don't know what the weather is going to be like. So those things are not data. They, you know, so what you need to know is not in these dots. These dots are 
bunch of old stuff. They can get you started in the conversation. But what you want to do is come up with a number that reflects your belief about what you think is going to happen by the managers who are going to be managing in this circumstance and who are going to get a bonus or get penalized if they don't meet their targets. So one of the, th the thing we're going to do in this book, your book does it, all books use this as a throwaway method, but to me, if you're going to use a, ma uh, a computational method, the best method is always high-low. Is it mathematically most accurate? No, but who cares? You don't care about that. And that is completely bogus concern that, you know, you're going to have a lot of professors or people tell you that. You know, ask them, well, ask, ask them how many years they've been a manager. And add, then ask them, do you, you know what? Is mathematical accuracy actually, you know, is mathematical accuracy on last year's data actually help you to be a better manager next year? Yeah, it's sort of a dumb question. Anyway, so what we're going to do to start the simulation is we're going to use a method that we'll put a line up there. And we'll use the line in our class and on the exam because we need, we need to get you to practice using the system. In a real organization, this line that you would come up with when, from the high-low method is just a line to start the discussion process for what people believe. And they can bring in their ideas about what they think they'll be spending next year. And this gives a framework for a start. So the high-low method starts with the high volume and low volume. And so that's a little bit of a mistake in the name. Because a, a mistake you, a lot of students make when they hear high-low, they don't know high-what, low-what. They often think of high-cost, low-cost. No. What we have to do in this method is we're looking for the high-production volume, low-production volume. So the high-production volume is here. Okay? So that's this point. Now notice we already discussed it might be a totally bogus point because it could be a weather-related issue. The low-production volume looks like it's about right here. So the high-low method is gonna, going to say that that's our prediction line. It's a starting point, right? So we're going to produce, we are going to compute it, come up with numbers based on the high-low method, and put that in our documents. And as I'm going to assume that you are wise enough to know that that is the initial document that's prepared to bring to the meetings to have the discussion about what we believe is going to happen here because the ultimate decision we have to make is what do we really think the price is going to be here and you know what one another reason not to use regression is people over trust regression like as soon as you put regression on there most people aren't well enough trained to argue against it and say don't you know we don't, don't want to do that so it actually well not only is a bad number they're always wrong and they're always they're wrong in really awful ways uh, they're just regression is stupid answers um, and the w even worse is that people don't have the guts to challenge them or the knowledge to challenge them. So we want to stay away from that fakery. In fact, what would regression do? You know, because when people do regression, they tend not to look at the data and they don't examine the data point by point. So this story I told it's a, where someone said, oh, I remember that was that weird weather pattern where, where we had really hot weather in, a, in November and so we didn't have to heat the buildings. So costs were lower. But when people do regression, they never, they never think that way. They never look at the data. They just have this Excel sheet with all the numbers. They just do the regression, form, you know, regression function or SPSS or you know, whatever software they're going to use. They get out the results. And you know what? That point right there, it's going to pull a line down. If you were to do a regression line without that point, a regression line without that point is probably going to be something like that. As soon as you put this point in, you're going to drop that regression line like that. That's going to change the slope, remember? Slope. It's going to change the slope probably 15%, that one point. And when you look at that point, it's probably bogus. And, and you just by looking at this with a little experience, one thing you'll start to do when you get experience is you'll look at all these outlier points. Like you'll look at this one and say, wait a minute, I need some explanation about this. Why, why this is, you know, what happened here? And you'll look at this one and this one at least. You'll probably pick, you know, I would say you'd probably pick that one, that one, and that one. And you'd say, I need some more investigation here because I'm not, I'm not using, I'm not going to bet my performance bonus or my company's future on some analysis that has points in it that are, you know, dumb. I remember we had a spoilage or something. Maybe this was when that airplane landed on the roof and all of a sudden costs are crazy. You know what? You don't want that in a regression analysis. 
So, uh, and re most people, as I said, I'm, I know I repeat myself a lot. When you start using regression analysis, people stop thinking about the data. They just pump it in, pump it out, look at the formula, off they go, and it's just trash, trash, trash. So this is the start, and I think the, I always want to start with the high-low method because it starts with something to get people talking. It is a line, and, it, and it's usually not that accurate, and everyone knows it, and they're not intimidated by it, so they start the conversations. And the conversation you really want to have happen, which you can't, we can't really do this in school, right, is the conversation of three or four experienced people to say, no, I think this is what it's going to cost next year. Or, you know, I was looking at the, the, the forecast with global warming. You know, uh, global warming temperature on average is going up, but we're going to have more fluctuations. So actually, heating costs could go up, even though the average temperature is going up. We could have more highs and more lows, and the highs will have to cool, the lows will have to heat. You know, so I'm thinking that actually going forward, our costs are going to be higher than even what a regression would say. Or someone else might say, look, we just, we're going to spend, let's spend some money and let's do some more insulation, which will bring some of the costs down, or get some new equipment that it's more, more efficient in terms of electricity use. So that's what you really need to be doing, and you know, we can't really do that in school. So we're doing the accounting part of it, meaning we're assuming that people are having these discussions. We're going to start off by preparing a set of documents that allows them to start. Okay, And so we're going to use the high-low method. So high-low is high volume. Whoops. And of course, I say high volume while I'm pointing to the low volume. High volume minus low volume. Okay, So it's the cost. So it's actually the cost at the high volume. Go to the high volume, get this cost. Go to the low volume, which is this one, get this cost. And so that's the difference in costs. And we're going to say that that line, actually, the slope of this line, is our variable cost. Okay, That's our starting position. Now, we're not going to claim that that is a true variable cost. This is our starting argument for discussion purposes. So we make a line here. The slope is considered the variable cost. And we will then draw have a line out here. And that's going to be the fixed cost. So we have fixed cost is this portion. And then this portion here, that curve here, is the variable cost. And we're going to do that through some simple arithmetic. And that's what we're doing for our presentation. So in Chapter 7, we're assuming that we're doing the initial presentation of this data and that we could easily lead to a different set. We are going to be careful. And, you know, the word accuracy is a dangerous word because you have to decide what you want to be accurate about and what tools you have. And in general, computational tools are not very good at accuracy unless you have incredible stability of the, the things that you have as your input items. Cost structures, suppliers, quality materials, labor costs, labor functions, quality machines, machine type products. I mean, everything has to be almost identical for a regression to have any predictive value. And that includes external market costs, you know, cost of commodities, kind of things. So it's not, it's a, a low likelihood proposition. So need to look at the data you have now for seven, problem 7.56. This is where you're going to, some people get hooked because even though I said it twice and I said it in the name, they're going to go to the high cost, low cost. No, it's the cost at the high volume minus the cost at the low volume. So if we look down our list here, look down the list of these uh, costs we've had. These are costs that we have experienced in different years and in different production volumes. Notice this is sorted by years. It's not sorted by production volume. So on the graph that we had, remember at first I, start, I sort of made a goof, I made a mistake. And I started to put time across here, and I changed it to volume. When you're trying to do this, that's what you're really interested in. Your data is based on time, but what you need to do is look at volume-based information. So if you look down this list, and you look down at the direct labor hours, okay, that's the only thing you have for production volume. It's not actually output. That would be better. But you try and look for one of the uh, volume-related things that you actually have control of, and it has labor hours, and you can say, okay, that is actually one type of volume that we have, a number of labor hours. So if you look down there, you'll see that the high labor hours, it would be 12,000, and the low labor hours is 7,000. So we want to take the cost at the high minus the cost at the low. So we're going to set up an equation like this. 
where we're going to say, we're also going to use the hours, so we're going to say 12,000, was it seven? Yep, seven. And above that, we're going to subtract the dollars associated with it. So you, you, just, you have to practice this a bunch of times. I cannot tell you how many exams that I've marked where people, because of sort of a little bit sloppy on the practice and thinking, oh, I understand that, they actually reverse this, where they'll actually put a different dollar figure here. Or another thing I can guarantee at least a couple of people on this class is going to do is you're going to go figure out what the high cost is, which in this case, the high cost is $62,500, and that was at the 11,000 direct labor hours. And then you're going to look at the low cost, which is $54,000. Both of those are totally wrong. It means you don't understand the actual method, which is high volume, low volume. So the cost that we have at the 12,000 would be 62,000 and 60,500. Okay. So we just do that, and what we'll get is dollars per direct labor hour, right? So stop before you get the number, look at this, this is dollars, this is units. What unit will the answer be in? Dollars per DLH, right? Notice that's going to be a variable cost, a sloped line. So our dollars per uh, uh, DLH are gonna be three, or point thir point three, point three dollars per DLH. This then is our uh, variable cost. Okay. We can use this to find the fixed cost because once we have the variable cost, we can then use the, the identity for costs to find the fixed cost. The next thing I'm going to put on the board, you will use in accounting questions for now to the end of eternity. It's called an identity, meaning it's always true under all circumstances, and we use it to find different things. It'll be on every, you know, somewhere. You may not have to actually do it on a professional exam, but the, I can guarantee you somewhere on, the, on every CFE exam, there's a question that, that you have to think through by knowing the logic of this. And that is total cost equals total variable cost plus total fixed cost. Right? We say it's an identity because we say it can't not be true. Okay? This is not something we discovered through science and, and statistics. We say that this is the world. The total cost equal total variable cost plus total fixed cost. And we can figure this out. Okay? So we can actually say total cost equals variable cost per unit, VC per unit, times the number of units plus total fixed cost. That's where we can use this. This is variable cost per unit. Units in this case are the direct labor hours. And so we can actually then take this, plug it back into this formula. Total cost, well, actually I shouldn't put total cost down there. I need to put the numbers down, not the letter total cost. We need to pick one of these, either this one or this one. We can pick either one, but we have to pick one of them. And I'm going to pick this one because it's the one that I did in my notes. It doesn't matter, you can pick this one to get the same answer. We're going to say at this level, the 7,000 level, this is the total cost, 60,500. So, 60,500 dollars here. Okay. 60,500 dollars equals variable cost per unit, 0.3 dollars per DLH times, the question is how many units? Well, it was 7,000. 7,000 plus TFC, total fixed cost. Then we multiply this out, and this becomes $2,100. So $60,500 equals $2,100 plus TFC. C, subtract this from both sides. So you should take that $2,100 and subtract it, off of, uh, subtract it off of both sides. 
and uh, you will get $58,400. So TFC equals, you know, 60,500 minus the 2100 is, I just looked it up, I can't do this in my head, not while I'm talking at any rate, is 54,000, what is that, 54, 58, 4. So that is actually our total fixed cost. Okay. So now we can actually go back and start to reconstruct our standard cost card because we have used a couple of different, you know, this method to start. Now, in a real organization, what you would probably do is from this and that point three, you would start the discussion and you would do, you know, it would take you a week to do. People would be arguing. You might use consultants, econometric consultants. You might want a forecast of of all the cost components, like what do you think electricity is going to cost, what's this going to cost. So you don't ever really use past information to forecast the future. Use it as a starting point. Now, because of the limitations of teaching cost accounting where we don't have a real company here, we are going to assume, we are going to take this starting point and put it back into the system as the end point. That's a weakness in what we're doing, okay? But, you know, we don't really have an option to do that. So we have the 58000 400 as the total fixed cost, and we have the $0.3 per direct labor hour as the total variable cost. So, we now come back to this, which is where we left off, but we had to go on a little side trip because, very, you know, because uh, the overhead cost is a bit of a trick to get going. But we now know what this is, right? These are, these standard prices are all variable costs. I haven't mentioned that before, but if you look at them, they're all variable costs. And what we did on the other page, now on you, you know, on your page, it should be the same. 0.3 dollars per DLH times, and then here's the hook here. Okay, this is a giant mental problem for almost all students, um, and it's a problem for you because. You really want this whole thing to be logical and make sense. Guess what? Life's really complicated. Our accounting systems are pretty good and they sort of mostly make sense. But they all have giant holes where they don't make sense. We have a lot of rough edges in our system. This is one of them. Is that whatever number you have here, if you're in a company that's using direct labor as your charge rate, right, for your predetermined overhead rate, which is what this is, this is a predetermined variable overhead rate, right? Then the number of direct labor hours here has to be the same. And you can see that actually, if you look at this and you look at the answer, you'll say that answer has to be dollars per one pound box, right? You know that, and actually this one also has to be dollars per one pound box. I didn't put these on here in the beginning because I was waiting to sort of lead you to the point where you could see that this is a weakness in the system, that we force this to happen, even though it may, it's not always clear that it makes sense, but computationally, we don't really see any other alternative. If this is true, we know this has to be true for the entire column, and if this is true, then this has to be dollar direct labor hours per one pound box. We don't have any choice. This units, this has to be the units if these are the units. And so we have to use the same. The paradox is that this has to be the same too. 0.25 dollars per one pound box. Okay? So this, in fact, is the weakest part of the entire system. This is a fairly weak part of the system. Almost all of you are going to stumble because when you start doing things and hit this, you're going to say, well, why do we do this? Well, it's, the system's slightly broken here. The worst part of the entire cost allocation measurement system is the way we, do with fixed, the way we deal with fixed costs. Okay? And so this piece and the connection to here are logically the weakest thing that we do in the entire system. I promise you that as you approach it, your brain is going to hit some of the weaknesses and you're going to say, some of this doesn't seem logical. You know, you're exactly right. But it, tie, it closes the circle and gives us a comprehensive system that mostly works in most of the places. 
a few places it doesn't work so well. And this, this and this combine to the place. When we get to chapter 8, we have the same problem in the variances. The variance related to this is the worst part of the entire variance structure. It just really almost doesn't make, it makes hardly any sense at all. Uh, but by doing it, it allows us to use the other parts of the system, and the other parts of the system make a fair amount of sense. Okay? But now we have to fill this in. This is actually our predetermined overhead rate for fixed costs. Or this, is our, this is our VOH POR. I love initials. Variable overhead predetermined overhead rate. We now also are going to have an FOH POR, fixed overhead predetermined overhead rate. I want to put this in now before I forget. That is uh, 0 0.075. Now we have to sit down and deal with this uh, the predetermined over the uh, the fixed overhead rate. Um, so we're going to start with the fifty-four thousand dollars. Okay. So remember, I uh, I need to turn this around again quickly. Remember, we computed that it's fifty-eight thousand four hundred dollars, but we need to know like how are we going to overhead rate charge this based on what? Well. Um, we're paying overhead for what? Well, it's actually the number of units. So notice that the budgeted number of production units has to loop back in here. And if you read the text carefully, because right now you're stuck, right? The numbers we have on this page, you can't really get an answer. You have to look for something outside of the system, excuse me, sort of outside of the technical uh, uh, accounting system. And you have to look into the budgeting system. So you have to say, okay, you have to, you know, first time you do this, it's next to impossible. After you do a couple of these problems, you'll start to say, okay, let me look for something in the budget that is how we're going to allocate this fixed cost. And so if you look around in there, you'll find a line that says we're going to make, ah, uh, here it is, the last line. Budgeted production volume is 20,000 boxes a year. Okay, that's a starting place. So you're going to take this, you know, and this is a different scratch sheet. You're going to say, okay, I have $58,400 divided by 20,000 boxes. Now, I'm going to get dollars per box. Uh, can I say boxes? I should say one pound boxes. Uh, and down here, one pound boxes. So, you know, is that really what you need here? And you look back and you go, you know, I need to put something here. Oh, I need to put dollars per direct labor hour here. I can't put dollars per box. But, you know, the data I have only gives me dollars per box. So I have to look at this and somehow see if I can transform this into dollars per box. Now, if I take the answer to this, okay, dollars per one pound box, and I divide it by the number of labor hours per one pound box, I can actually come up with a dollar per labor hour figure. Okay? Now I can see actually on my sheet, I'm gonna, I didn't, I didn't put the subtotal in. Remember I said on spreadsheets you always need subtotals? Well, you know, I didn't do it on here, so I'm gonna have to, in the middle of my video, pick this up and do a division here. So this is $2.92 per box, but we need dollars per direct labor hour. So if we take uh, the $2.92 per box that we have, and then we actually divide this, so $2.92 per one pound box, and divide this by 0.25 uh, DLH per one pound box. Remember this 0.25 DLH per one pound box is the standard quantity. So we have to divide that by the standard quantity. That is this standard quantity, DLH per one pound box, right? So this is, I'm not just making that number up. That's, we needed to record that and save it. Then over here, I hope you're not getting dizzy with this thing turning around. We have to take the dollars per box, divided it by
by the standard quantity of labor hours to make a box. Now, if you look at these units and reconcile them, what are you going to come up with? Dollars per one pound box divided by direct labor hours per one pound box. Well, you invert and multiply. If you invert and multiply, these cancel. And it's going to leave you with dollars per direct labor hour. Boom. Presto. That's what you needed. Now, you know you needed that because you now, you're an expert at the form, and you know what units have to be in every one of those things. So there you go. It's the 2.92 divided by 2.5, or 0.25, and that'll give you dollars per direct labor hour, and it's 11.68. Okay. Around we go. Okay, you know, after you work this problem about three times, it won't be as hard, but trust me, the first time you work this problem, you're, you know, your head's going to spin. Notice how many balls you have in the air to get this problem right. You have a lot going on, a lot of things. A lot of them, you, if you've done it before, but you haven't actually brought it together in as precise a way. So this is going to be a difficult problem. And there's one piece that's actually we haven't put on there. I was, it's a little bit low on the board, um, so I was actually going to erase the top and put this on. So now, down here at the bottom, you're going to put something that I'm right going to, I'm going to put here on the top, and this would be the budget formula. So when you say standard cost card, you, should in, you need to include the budget formula also. In this case, our budget formula is our uh, total cost equals, from the other side, it's that uh, 58 thousand four hundred dollars plus point three dollars per DLH okay so no oh, did I write that down all of a sudden no you know what I jumped too far because I was talking I forgot to add the right things together I'm focused on what we're doing you have to go back and look at all your variable costs these are your variable costs Okay, for this product, you need to add these together. That's what you need up here is you need this dollars per one pound box. Those are your variable costs. If you add all of these together, that will give you your total variable cost to make the, each one pound box of chocolate. Your total variable cost will be 3.6749. This is your budget formula. So this is an important number, but it's the average cost. Okay? And talented users, experienced users know it's an average. That different circumstances, if 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 something crazy and insane happens, like a virus that attacks, you know, Canada and sales of, of expensive chocolate drop like a rock, well we know that because this is an average cost, it has built into it all those average assumptions. If we want to find out what happens, you know, when, when the bottom falls out of the market, this is actually the cost that will figure out the cost at, every, at any given interval, at any given specific uh, production volume. So that actually allows our cost to forecast to go up and down. This is the one that we often need for things like interim financial reports. Okay, we can use this as our cost of goods sold for our interim financial reports. But if we want to do more forecasting work, like more not accounting work, but finance work, this is our estimating equation for what, the tr what we believe the true cost will be at any given production volume. This then is the last line. So now you have the standard cost card. Remember, it has a title, which I erased. It has the lo these line items set up in this way with these, with these uh, uh, units attached. It has the, stand, the SAMSI standard absorb, absorptive manufacturing cost at the bottom. And below that, it has the manufacturing cost equation, which is the total cost is equal to the fixed cost, total fixed cost, plus the variable cost per unit, okay, times the number of units. That was, I forget, should have put that up there. Times, you know, units. Okay. So that concludes problem 7.0. Five, six, a very important problem. Don't do this first, though. Do the 7.54 a couple of times until that's really solid. 
come back and do this. The first three are set up to be fairly easy. This problem is trying to focus on this, so uh, on the overhead. So it's making the first three f a little bit easier. See if you can just whip through them, but try and do them perfectly. Try and make sure that this is how you want to present it on the exam. Also, so you have, you'll have space on the exam. You're not going to be too crammed in. And also, with a little experience, when you look at the problem, you'll know how much space you need. It's perfectly okay to put in here all of these little equations that you did. So any, any uh, uh, find, finding the realization rate and the loss rate and that stuff, put that right in here. Just put a circle around it. Anything that you put here with a circle around it or off to the side, it's totally fine. It's a scratch sheet, and it actually will make this a little bit easier you know, easier to understand. So now you're at a pretty hefty level of complexity, even though, you know, like the way I went over, it might say make it seem simple. You're going to have a lot of balls in the air when you're doing this. And there are, there's another problem here that, that uh, we'll need to take a look at. I forget the number, but uh, it is where? Which one is a really ugly, ugly problem? But we need to look at it as a special kind of uh, variance problem. And so my notes, I didn't write it down, so I was having to flip through the book to figure it out. And I don't actually see it in here. So anyway, there's a, trust me, there is another problem in here that has, I think, seven kinds of raw material. Okay, And each one has a different denominator. So. When you hit something like that, that's when this gets to be a big mess. And in this problem, that we'll, I will work on it in one of the videos, you actually have to, oh, that's why it's not here. It's on chapter 8. That's why it's not a chapter 7 problem. When you get to chapter 8, you end up having to do this, and then you have to do the variances along with it. And so the complexity comes even higher than what you're seeing here. Even this can be pretty high. So work as many problems as you can in chapter 7. Uh, in the next series of lectures, we'll move into Chapter 8 and introduce the journal entry sequence and the variance analysis. The journal entries change a little bit. We don't have nine anymore. We add two because we're going to end up having a, two more things happen. So the standard, the standard journal entry sequence changes a little bit, but then we add the concept of the uh, uh, variances and variance analysis. And that causes a big addition to the complexity that you face when you're actually starting to do this. So anyway, this is a good problem. Work on it. Uh, you can see things are starting to heat up in a technical, uh, computational way. And so we need to be focusing on that. And we will, uh, in the next series of lectures, do a little bit more complicated things uh, and move into Chapter 8. So that is uh, the end of the core part of standard costing.